Tragic heroes are carefully written to heed warning to not follow in character's footsteps. They possess a tragic flaw which will inevitably rip everything from them until they are left with nothing. Thelos is one of the scariest, if not the scariest villains I have come across. He is calculated, wise, intelligent, and manipulative, allowing him to mold the world into his world. The people are his people, his enemies are his enemies, fights against him are his fights, mistake or not, it will fall into his plans just as he desired. To defeat someone with such a powerful iron fist over an entire society, there must be some something catastrophic that results in their downfall. Achilles would have been unstoppable, but we all knew from the start his heel would eventually bring his demise. In order to understand a character's fatal flaw, we must first understand the character and all of its complexity, from both a psychological and literary perspective. Despite being the main antagonist of the show, Bellos doesn't get any screen time until the second last episode of season 1. Before his first appearance, his presence is constant. He is everywhere and everything, looming over the boiling aisles with a wholly devout resume. His influence is tied to all, developing an intimidating villain that evokes feelings of unease without ever having to establish such a reputation through his own actions as a character. Season 1 has a slow start to its plot, each episode slowly giving more and more information on the world of the Boiling Isles. During this time, we slowly put together more pieces about the Emperor's Coven and the Coven systems that Bellos has created. Bellos uses his charisma to his advantage by manipulating the people he comes across. He gives himself such an influence over the people in the Boiling Isles that his presence isn't even needed to control the actions of others. His reign over the Isles has only lasted 50 years, yet his theocracy has completely changed the way society is structured from the legal system to personal lives. The manipulation over the Boiling Isles began with him traveling around town by town preaching the dangers of wild witches. He claims that the Titan speaks through him and believes wild witches to be using the Titan's gift in vain. The correct way to harness magic is by separating it into nine covens using sigils, which are supposed to protect the individual and make the Titan happy. Eventually, he gains devout followers to this religion, believing in the separation of magic tracks and preaching the fear of wild witches. Wild witches are ostracized, shamed, imprisoned, and executed for not limiting the use of their magic. Only through various rigorous trials of life or death will the Titan deem you worthy of harnessing all magic and grant you the privilege of joining the Emperor's Coven under Bellos' rule. Once joining the Emperor's Coven, you will almost certainly lose contact with your family and friends in order to enforce the Titan's will as a Coven Scout. You practically sign away your life to devote yourself to the Emperor and satisfy the Titan. The end goal of the Emperor's Coven is to make it to Paradise during the Day of Unity, where everyone in the Boiling Isles will travel to the head of the Titan in order to merge with another world that is free of wild magic. Respected, loved, and feared by his followers, Bellos becomes worshipped as a messiah and is recognized as the most powerful witch in the Boiling Isles. In reality, they have fallen victim to a cult controlled under his thumb to do his bidding for him, to make the world in his image, not the Titans. A paradise free of wild magic, and to Bellos, a world free of any magic at all. Bellus is a character grounded in realistic fiction amidst a fantasy horror genre. His purpose narratively is to rip the fantasy from under your feet and force you to face the most horrific and vile realities that take place in our world, the human realm. The demon realm isn't real, but at some point, wasn't Philip Wittabane? Here's a quick American history lesson. In the late 1600s, out of the 13 colonies that were beginning roots to what is now the United States, Massachusetts Bay Colony, Saybrook Colony, New Haven Colony, and most importantly, the Connecticut Colony, were all Puritan. Puritans were ex-members of the Church of England who separated themselves spiritually due to disagreements over Bible interpretations and the place it should have politically. They wished to purify the Church of England and made the pilgrimage overseas to the colonies in order to have the religious liberty to do so. These beliefs would help aid to the motivations that would eventually lead to the American Revolution in the late 1700s, although by the time of the American Revolution, Puritans would be greatly dwindling in followers. Systematically, the beliefs in Puritanism are still present today. Them and other more traditional conservative Christian groups would generally consist of the same people who claim that the owl house encourages to sin onto children for promoting witchcraft, people existing aren't cishet, and so forth. Which is incredibly ironic because out of anyone that would need to see this video, it would be those people. The Connecticut colony was Puritan. Luce lives in Connecticut, which means the portal is in Connecticut, which means Bellos lived in the Connecticut during the 1600s when it was an established Puritan colony. If that's not enough evidence that he's Puritan, then this is. The Puritans were excessively paranoid of demonology and witchcraft, believing the weakest members of their society were vulnerable to being possessed by the devil himself. Any person suspected to be satanic was accused a witch and killed. Puritans were responsible for many witch hunts that occurred during this time period. I'm sure you've heard of the famous Salem witch trials, where a town became desperate to 
to cleanse their community of the devil's magic, putting to trial over 200 people and executing 20. But a lesser known fact, predating the Salem witch trials by almost 30 years, in 1647 to 1663, the Connecticut witch trials took place, resulting in 11 executions. In Philip's diary entries, he states at some point that it is around 1660 to 1670. A previous entry mentions after five years. Using this, we can figure out that he has been in the demon realm since at least 1655, potentially most likely longer than that. Those dates line up with the Connecticut witch trials. I refuse to believe that was intentional. Why else would they have chosen Connecticut as the setting out of any US state? Who the fuck lives in Connecticut? Why are you in there? Who are you? So, here are the facts. Bellis is a Puritan raised in a time where witchcraft was literally hunted down. His desire is to become a witch hunter and wants to be recognized for his efforts. He is claiming to be saving humanity from evil. Witches are believed to be the devil in disguise, and I'm sure I don't have to explain that the devil would be the staple of sin to a Puritan, thus the purest form of evil imaginable, hence why he wishes to wipe them out to save humanity. None of that is particularly groundbreaking information, I hope. For someone to be manipulative, they had to have learned it from somewhere. Bellis didn't just come into the world twisting his words to get exactly what he wanted. He had to learn that pattern of behavior from somebody or something around him. While we don't have much of any information on Bellis's past, it's not very hard to figure out with the right historical knowledge. Granted, please keep in mind that this is entirely speculation, so I'm going to keep this as vague as possible while still getting the point across. Puritanism is a cult. It is a religion that thrives off of an oppressive authority over its followers. The beliefs are pushed onto their subjects through manipulation and fear. Conformity is expected as deviation will make you appear an unwelcome outsider and, in an absolute worst case scenario, could you lead you to getting physically abused or executed. Outsiders were not tolerated. They wanted religious freedom, but only for themselves. Anyone who didn't adhere to the beliefs would be damned in the eyes of God. Puritans were especially strict of many religiously motivated superstitions, as were many other Christian religions during colonial times. Puritans were mainly concerned over magic that would pose God, especially witchcraft. The time period Bellis grew up in was also undoubtedly when Puritans were at their most radical. The panic that surged from the paranoia of witches cultivated extreme reactions, resulting in multiple witch trials, the most gruesome being the Salem witch trials. Not to mention he lived in the human realm during the same time frame of the Connecticut witch trials. This means that Bellis grew up in a very paranoid Puritan society when it was at its most oppressive. Children who were at their most formative years would be greatly influenced by this environment, causing them to develop rather radical views themselves, just as Bellos did. Children were not allowed to play games unless given permission by their parents. They were raised with strict rules and to obey without freedom to their own will. They were taught to never publicly express their emotions, even the good ones. At some point, an abuse victim either chooses to end the cycle or become an abuser himself. I think it's pretty obvious which route Bellos took. Religious trauma is a running theme in the Owl House. It gets explored through Lilith, Hunter, Steve, and Kiki Morrow, though discussing that would be an entirely separate video in itself. It's not by mistake or coincidence that Bellis's character is the one that enforces such an oppressive religious cult. Irony seems to plague Bellos' character, as it is ironic that Bellos would choose to maliciously control the boiling Isles through religious means without ever having the self-awareness to understand that he's cultivated the same environment he grew up in. Bellus genuinely believes he is a good guy of pure intentions. He sees himself as a hero of the story, a man who took the most noblest act to sacrifice his own humanity in order to save the rest. It is tragically ironic. He hopes to cleanse the world of the sin that torments humanity by taking it out from the inside. He will do anything in his power to stop the evil, including tampering with the dark forces of magic himself, prolonging his life centuries past his life expectancy, and sacrificing his life as it was in order to purge the world of all that is unholy. These motivations make complete sense of his character. He was raised as a Puritan, who are known for their witch trials and obsessions of cleansing humanity through the devil's influence. Growing up in a time so obsessed with witches, he sets out his life's goal to eradicate the devil in disguise in order to purify humanity. Had he finished the day of unity in the 17th century, he would have been a hero. He couldn't have known society would have progressed past witch hunting when it was how he's raised to live and how society structured around him. That doesn't make him redeemable or any less horrific, but it sure does add layers. Terrifying, realistic layers. However, a motivation as static as this would completely ruin the integrity of Bellis' character. It would make him a very anticlimactic and quite frankly really boring as a villain. His character has more nuance to it than being a witch hunter thanks to one single part of his story that turns him into a dynamic villain, the Grimwalkers.
The most influential moment in the history of the Boiling Isles was a knife fight between two Puritan white dudes 350 years ago that nobody even knows about. And when I say influential, I mean this moment completely haunts the show from the start. Bellus looms over everything with great power and malice, but Caleb haunts the Boiling Isles with traces of him being found everywhere if you're looking for it. In Season 2, Episode 9, Eclipse Lake, the episode opens up with a shot of a book open to a page on something called a Grimwalker. At the time of the episode airing, this was an entirely foreign concept to the viewers. A Grimwalker appeared to be creating sentient life from taking powerful objects. The ingredient used to create a Grimwalker consists of a Galderstone, Palestrum Wood, Selkie Dama Scales, and a Bone of Ortet. Malicious intent is almost guaranteed when creating a Grimwalker, as Galderstones are protected due to their immense power, Selkie Damas are peaceful creatures and obtaining skills requires killing them, and a Bone of Ortet implies stealing from a corpse. Fans quickly piece together a conclusion that this must be some form of dark magic found upon in the Boiling Isles, or perhaps long forgotten to history. Ortet is a term used in describing a form of asexual reproduction in certain plants. It's the original plant from which clones have descended. Therefore, it was pretty easy to figure out that Bone of Ortet had something to do with cloning. And then there's the magenta eyes on the page, matching the eyes of only one character in the entire series. Hunter. It is with this single frame that fans were able to piece together the result of what we'd soon find to be a gruesome story, a story that at the time we had no idea would have led to the discovery of the most influential moment in the entire Boiling Isles history. All we knew was that in some way Hunter was a clone, but of who and why? In Season 2, Episode 10, Yesterday's Lie, this theory thickens, leaving more questions than answers. We see a statue in the town of Gravesfield with two unnamed humans, one resembling Philip Woodabane and the other looking awfully similar to Hunter. In Eclipse Lake, a drawing in Philip's diary also resembles the other statue. At this point in the series, the theory that Philip and Bellas were the same person was starting to take off as well, but had not been confirmed. This episode also has a newspaper clipping with a story that was brought up two times, a tale of two brothers who were lured away by a witch and never seen again. And as the rules of storytelling go, if it is brought up more than once, it probably has some significance. In this newspaper clipping, one of the humans was drawn with a bird resembling a cardinal on his shoulder, kickstarting the theory that Flapjack used to belong to this mystery man. In Season 2, Episode 12, Elsewhere and Elsewhen, we get the confirmation that Philip Wodobain is, in fact, the same person as Bellos. We see him taking palisman souls just as Bellos does. In the cave he seems to live in, there are more diagrams and interesting background details that relate to Grimwalkers. We see multiple pin charts of the same drawing of eyes as before and various bones of a body. In Season 2, Episode 13, we see the Golden Guard sigil for the first time, which happens to be the exact same symbol of Gravesfield. And when needing a cover name, Flapjack suggests the name Caleb. Uh, Caleb? Uh, Caleb! A name that was popularized in the 1600s by Puritans in the American colonies. Thus, this is a conclusion theorists weave together. Hunter is a clone of a person who is depicted in Philip's diary and in the Gravefield statue. This unnamed individual is presumably Philip's brother and they both somehow got trapped in the demon realm, just like the old tale told. This man was probably named Caleb and had Flapjack as a palisman. Somehow he died and, for whatever reason, Bellos has put his efforts into cloning him. Hunter was the result. Or, well, Hunter was one of the results, as we find out in Season 2, Episode 16, Hollow Mind. Hunter was the last of dozens of other Grimwalkers who were murdered by Bellos. He had been cloned in an attempt to create a better version of an old friend, a better version of an old friend, and was to be discarded when he inevitably chose to betray Bellos, just as every single Grimwalker before Hunter had. And had you been paying attention to the backgrounds in the episode, you would have noticed the various paintings telling another story, a story that finally wraps everything together. Sort of. A man, who looks practically identical to Hunter with only a few minor inaccuracies, is illustrated growing up with Bellos and paintings throughout his mindscape. They seem to play together, have hunted witches together, and more. They wind up stumbling upon a witch and coming to the Boiling Isles. The details between this and their next moments depicted are practically non-existent, however the story that unfolds is clear. Bellos' presumed brother meets a witch, makes a life for himself in the Boiling Isles, and settles down. In the next paintings, Bellos is shown killing his brother with a knife. In Season 2, Episode 21, Bellos sees Flapjack sending him into a fit of rage as he yells the name Caleb. Caleb. Which leads us to now. Philip and Caleb Woodabang, two men who grew up in the Puritan-inhabited Connecticut colony sometime during the 1600s and were raised by witch hunters, find themselves in a demon realm. At some point, Caleb realizes that the witches aren't evil, abandons the Puritan teachings he was raised with, and starts a new life in the world they were taught to despise. Philip, who never lets go of his Puritan beliefs, watches his older brother go from standing by his side to abandoning their cause to join forces with the devil. He kills his brother for committing the atrocious sin and repeatedly clones and kills the lookalike. Likes. 
Without his presumed older brother, it's very easy to dwindle Bellows down to a product of his time, that he was just someone who grew up taught an initial prejudice and grew to serve the world in service of his bias, that he was only evil because that's just how it was back then. Do you see how that mentality regarding Bellows' character takes away from how complex he is and, quite frankly, how terrifying he is? It completely rips away how real his character feels and would instead turn him into one of those flat villains with little nuance like I had described before. Just an evil, old, Puritan white guy. Ooh, scary. See, the thing is, he's horrifying because Caleb exists. And no, not because he murdered him, although fratricide is definitely one of the more horrendous ways to go down a path of villainy. Caleb grew up in the same society as Philip. Caleb was presumably a witch hunter, just as Bellos was. I'd even say that the paintings in Hollow Mind insinuate that he encouraged Bellos' witch hunting prejudices. Yet Caleb did one thing Bellos didn't. He learned. He changed, and he became a better person. He is proof that it wasn't just being a product of his time that turned Philip Woodbane into Emperor Bellows. It even supplies the narrative of the message that history was screwed up for that, and that even if it was normalized, those prejudices were not acceptable. It wasn't that he was lucky to be able to see the past, because anyone can do that. Again, anyone can do that. Even during that time period, change was possible. Caleb chose to see past his bigotry he grew up with and became a better person in spite of it. Bellows did not. When it came to, Bellos chose to murder his brother and create clones of him over and over and over. And every single time that Grimwalker would choose to change from the mold Bellos had designed and became better. Every time this was wrong and Bellos had no choice but to eradicate them. He traverses the world and meets these witches living their lives peacefully. He finds his brother happy and he is so blinded by prejudice that he doesn't really see any of it. He is blinded not by being a product of his time, but by choice. He chooses to be loyal to the ideals he was taught without ever questioning them. He is right and they are wrong, stuck in black and white thinking of nothing more, nothing less. Therefore, at the end of the day, his brother is a fool, perhaps brainwashed or possessed. If he's happy, then he's disgusting and must be conversing with the devil. You could even theorize that he fornicated with a witch, or maybe they were married. Either way, Bellos was pissed that the bros before hoes code was broken. I think that's where the real terror of Bellos comes from. Not the murder, not the genocide, not his slowly crumbling humanity as he lives longer and longer than he is naturally supposed to. Isn't it so scary that we can become so wrapped up in our biases that we can turn into the worst versions of ourselves, that this isn't fictional, that this has happened throughout history, that it still happens to this day. Bellos didn't change in a disturbing self-righteous act he ends up killing his own brother, which is the point of no return for him. He is a testament to how ignorance might be the grandest sin of them all. And he is none of that without Caleb would have been proving Bellos would have been a much, much different man had he have just made the choice to be open-minded. When asked what a Grimwalker is, Bellos answers with, he's a better version of an old friend. He's a better version of an old friend. But that doesn't really explain anything. Honestly, it just makes things a hell of a lot more confusing. So he creates the Grimwalkers to be better versions of Caleb. In his eyes, a better version of his brother is someone who blindly obeys him and is unrelentlessly loyal to his witch-hunting escapades. But why? If you really think about it, this is an outlier to his previously stated motivations. It doesn't really contribute to them whatsoever other than giving him a lackey to aid his conquest of the Boiling Isles. That's something he could do without cloning the man he murdered. It is very clearly something he can do without a golden guard because he regularly manipulates people into doing his bidding and eventually mansplain <laughs> and eventually mansplain and manipulate manslaughters his way into being emperor of the Boiling Isles. He literally builds an entire army. He doesn't need the Grimwalkers, especially not once he's emperor. Actually, they serve more as a risk to him as not a single one has ever stayed loyal. The entire reason he creates them is defective because at some point they all betray him. And Bellos isn't stupid. He is incredibly intelligent. His knowledge of the demon realm is more intricate than any other witch or demon alike, and his emotional intelligence grants him the power over everyone else. He plays his cards carefully and is able to twist things into his plans, even if they don't turn out the way he expected. The only reason the Day of Unity failed is because he quite literally could not have accounted for single Titan somehow being alive and being in the right place to free the Collector to stop the draining spell. Loose outsmarting him and branding him with a sigil wasn't even enough to thwart his plans. It took a described child of the stars of literal god powers to stop him. So why does he keep creating the Grimwalkers? He doesn't need them and he's smart enough to know that there's a potential risk with them that could, at the very least, be a setback to his plans. Something I've always said is the most telling thing about a character is the thing that makes them act out of character, the thing that makes a composed character lose their temper, the thing the fearless character cowers, and the thing the selfless hero takes for themselves. Those moments expose a character 
teenager's biggest vulnerability. It is something they value over everything else, even their ideals. The Grimwalkers expose a vulnerability in Bellos' psyche that would otherwise be left unseen. And I cannot for the life of me piece together a concisive reason as to why. Each explanation completely rips out the foundations of where Bellos' self-imposed sole reason for existing lies. Is it because he misses his brother deep down? Is it because he seeks revenge? Does he resent his brother so much for supposedly abandoning him that he finds joy in murdering a lookalike over and over? Can he not see himself continuing his plans witch hunting without his brother working his right hand by his side? Does he regret killing his brother but cannot cope with it so he kills him over and over in order to prove that he was in the right? Does he genuinely want one of the Grimwalkers to succeed and never leave his side so he can have his brother back in the way he wanted him while he was alive? The answer is yes and no to probably every single one of those because they're all probable and emotions are messy and complicated and don't make any logical sense. But that made me realize, of course it doesn't make sense. There's nothing logical about him making the Grimwalkers. It's entirely irrational and motivated by his emotions. Bellus's character is personified oppression. His beliefs that stem from his Puritan background are the very beliefs that has systematically formed much of the bigotry in America. To have his fatal flaw be something that quite literally destroys his entire motivation and render it meaningless is appropriate to the context. Bigotry of any kind opposes a belief that can only stand on its own because the second outside sources are attributed to it, its entire foundation comes crumbling down. Being gay is unnatural until science proves that it is, so then the argument for homophobes becomes misconstrued statistics or religiously charged because their view cannot be factually supported. Women are not equal to men until science points out that there is no difference between sexes other than different functioning genitals and certain hormones, hormones which aren't consistently the same amongst each individual member of the sex and can even be medically changed. Thus, the argument becomes fueled of histories of social constructs, something fabricated by individual cultures alone. Racism is literally just societal stigma because we're all humans in the exact same species as each other. No science backs up the existence of racism in a biological standing. All these forms of bigotry have arguments isolated from real facts, using flimsy arguments generally supported by constructs created by humanity, not nature, because it's impossible to prove them correct when no evidence supports it. Bellus's character is entirely motivated by bigotry. This is made very obvious in the context of witches, as he's planning to commit genocide to this entire group of people. However, to fully understand this, you need to look at the story's undertones and what kind of message the writers are trying to push in a meta sense. The Boiling Isles is more or less supposed to represent hell at least in the eyes of Puritans in the 1600s. It's where witches come from, who are the devil in disguise to the Puritans. The human realm is shown to be just as it is in real life. It can be assumed that all discrimination does exist in the Owl House's universe. The demon realm has almost all of these things normalized. LGBT people, equality amongst people of color, women seemingly treated equally even back during the Dead Wardian era. It seems that most discrimination, if not all, that existed in the human realm is a foreign concept in the Boiling Isles. Historically, Bellus would probably be racist, homophobic, transphobic, ableist, and misogynistic, just to name a few. The Boiling Isles is what he sees as a representation of all evil, things that are different to the Puritan society he lived in. Long ramble short, Bellos is a bigot and that historically checks out. Bellos' love for his brother, his desire to have his brother in his life, it exposes that bigotry tenfold and reflecting on it in any capacity begins to completely dismantle everything Bellos has stood for. Killing his brother and cloning him is the memory that causes him the most anguish because I don't even think Bellos really understands why he's making the grandma. He doesn't integrally understand why, anyways. He knows what he tells himself the reason is, whatever he tells himself is what he wholeheartedly believes the reason to be and what he acts on, but analyzing a character should never be done at such face value. We have seen that he lies to himself as a defense mechanism. In Hollow Mind, he has a hall of lies that he tells others, but that is not something he would consciously create in order to thwart potential spies from seeing into his mind. There's nothing in the show that even indicates something like that is possible, only that strong emotions can manifest. Strong emotions like delusions or anguish, maybe separate souls such as the palisman too. It seems the mindscape structure is an entirely unconscious process. He hates witches and wants to eradicate them. In doing so, he learns to live as one of them and become one of the most powerful witches in the Boiling Isles. Witchcraft is the devil's magic, yet he uses it not just to harm witches, but to selfishly clone his brother over and over. Either for revenge satisfaction or otherwise, it doesn't matter. He wants to save humanity, yet his idea of saving humanity has completely taken his own from him and turned him into a monster. He's clearly aware of this discrepancy in his logic too. He will never admit to it, but bringing it up infuriates him. You got so used to eating Palisman, you can barely keep your human shape anymore! 
When Lewis calls him a hypocrite, he deflects his subject. You're such a hypocrite. You talk big about protecting humanity, but after everything you've done, you're barely human yourself. I do pity you. He cannot explain his prejudice beyond witches are evil because my religion's interpretation of the Bible says so. He can't support that prejudice in any other way unless he frames himself and others as a victim to the devil's onslaught. These monsters have warped your sense of reality. He is so submerged in his own delusion that he cannot bring himself to actually look at anything around him without his insubstantial bias. To make matters worse, he can't ever be made aware of this. He hit his point of no return the moment he plunged that knife into his brother. If he ever became aware of how wrong he is, he would then have to face the reality that he murdered his beloved brother over a deleterious aspiration. Genesis 4. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master. It. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. I did not just recite an entire Bible verse for no reason. The story of Cain and Abel from the book of Genesis, a story in the Geneva Bible which Puritans studied, is a lesson in the dangers of sin. It is a show that giving into sin can have disastrous consequences. Cain was jealous of his brother because his offering was accepted where his was not. He murders his brother in a fit of rage, and when confronted, he rhetorically asks the Lord, Am I my brother's keeper? In a story with as much religious undertone as the Owl House, I sincerely doubt the parallel between Cain and Bellows was unintentional. We don't actually know what happened between Caleb and Philip. We know enough to understand that Caleb separated himself from the Puritan teachings and found himself enjoying his time in the Boiling Isles, but we don't know how Bellows perceived his brother's decision to make a life for himself in the demon realm. We know he murdered him for it, but we don't know Bellows' feelings towards the event. We don't know what they said to each other, how the tension between them escalated, or why Bellows followed through with it. We aren't shown any of that because we don't need it in order to figure it out. As any character would, Bellows establishes a behavioral pattern through his actions. His worst memory is killing his brother, but when he sees the palisman his brother once had his own, he gets caught in a blinding rage, angrily yelling out Caleb's name. Caleb. This tells us that he wouldn't hesitate to kill the original Caleb again, despite it causing him distress. With the Grimwalkers, he obviously sees their inevitable rebellion as betrayal, and while yes, they are tools Bellas creates to be disposable pawns, they are still created in the image of his brother. He kills them without noticeable remorse and even seems to enjoy it. Some twisted part of him was glad to watch his brother die in his hands. Whatever his true feelings are, this reveals that somewhere there is resentment towards his brother, a form of grief caused by his betrayal of their religion and a sense of superiority to deem himself worthy of the privilege to punish him as he sees fit. Luce is the first human Bellos interacts with in hundreds of years. He doesn't have the same disdain for her as he does with witches and demons. What he says to her really brings forward an understanding of his character, but if you think about it, it actually reveals a lot of information about his disagreement with Caleb and their conflicting views as well. Please, I don't want to see another human life destroyed by this place. I do pity you. These monsters have warped your sense of reality. Perhaps it'd be merciful to put you out of your misery. Oh, wait! We don't belong here. I'm not like you! He doesn't want to see another human life destroyed by this place. That line is so obviously referring to Caleb, the only other human we are shown to have been ruined by the boiling aisles in Bellos' eyes. Witches were said to seduce men and lure them into sin. What Bellos says to Luz lines up with that. He believes they have warped her sense of reality and that it would be merciful to kill her. And they, as humans, don't belong there. They both shouldn't be there. I think Bellos killed Caleb because he believed he was brainwashed by the wishes and that it would be merciful to kill him. He 
he most likely resented him for falling victim to the very thing they were taught to hunt their whole lives, perhaps even resentful that he was abandoned for the devil by someone he clearly cares about, as even if Caleb still loved him, he made the impossible choice by siding with evil. More importantly, he believes he has the authority to single-handedly decide to take both Caleb and Luce out of their supposed misery. Throughout all his interactions, it's hard not to notice how he treats the people around him. Of course, viewing witches and demons as vile sin would lead to treating them as if they were inferior to him. He believes he is integrally more righteous and holy than them and will treat them as nothing more than the dirt under his shoe. Naturally, he manipulates them in order to bend them to his will. This pattern is increasingly obvious when speaking to Luce, another human. After all, she is the demographic he is attempting to save from the boiling isles. Luce is entirely powerless in the face of Bellos. He could very easily kill her. He almost does kill her. She poses no real threat to him. Even managing to outsmart him is not enough to stop him. Again, Bellos would have succeeded with the Day of Unity had it not been for the Collector being freed by a titan he was unaware existed. So when he tells Luce to come with her through the portal, that he wants her to make it back to their realm, it's not hard to believe that he's being genuine. He has nothing left to gain, no schemes left to ploy, and no witches left to exterminate. He has, as far as he's concerned, already won. Yet the way he speaks to her is laced with superiority. He believes he knows better than her, that he is the hero in this situation that he is the beacon of morality. There is a clear behavioral pattern. Bellos wants to be a hero. Bellos wants to be recognized and awarded for his achievements. He treats everyone as if they are lesser than him. He cannot acknowledge when he is in a wrong or see the error in his ways. He believes he's always in the right, so how could anyone else know better than him or ever be treated as an equal? Even his older brother is beneath him. Bellos has a god complex. Contrary to what it sounds like, a god complex isn't believing you have the powers of a god, it's simply acting as if you were better than those around you due to an inflated ego and infallibility. It's similar to a superiority complex, but without the mask insecurity underneath. His feelings of superiority to others lead him to having no remorse in his actions. He does not feel guilt, or at least will not admit to feeling any. This literally causes him to not only attempt mass genocide, but to become a serial killer by definition. And to top it all off, if he did hope for one of the Grimwalkers to be successful, then he's doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results. He's insane. Cain murders his brother Abel out of believing he deserved better and that he was above him. God gives him a lifelong punishment for having such a misplaced ego. Bellos' hidden motivation, his fatal flaw, is his pride. He was so obsessed with eradicating the world of sin that he ended up committing one himself. I can summarize Bellos' entire character with a two-word literary device, a fine case of tragic irony. Tragic irony is a type of dramatic irony where the audience, and in some cases others within the story, are aware of something the character is not. Tragic irony's only distinction from dramatic irony is that it results in tragedy. Dramatic irony would be us finding out Bellos and Philip are the same person before Luce. Not inherently tragic by any means, it just serves to add tension to the story. Tragic irony, on the other hand, is the audience understanding that Bellos' views are incredibly outdated, and that his heroic cause is for absolutely nothing because, as Luce says, nobody is going to take him seriously. By all means, if the Owl House were written with Bellos as our protagonist, his story would structurally follow that of a tragic hero, someone who sets out to do a valiant task in order to aid their people, only to end in defeat. Tragic heroes have three major characteristics. First is Hamartia, hero's fatal flaw. Second is Peripatia, a reversal of circumstances due to the hero's poor judgment. And third, Hubris, the character's excessive pride, which is often considered their true nemesis in the story. Tragic heroes are meant to be sympathetic, and while Bellows throughout the events of the Owl House is anything but sympathetic, if you take a deep dive into his character and analyze the information we've been given through historical context, we can find out that he was a devout Puritan. To say him being a victim to what is a radical religion isn't the least bit sympathetic is cruel. It's an incredibly screwed up story, he made all the wrong choices, but you can see where it started. A kid who was raised to devote his life to God or else be ostracized and brutally punished by those he grew up with. Bellos' hamartia is his hubris paired with prejudice that leads him down a dark path of no redemption. His peripatia is his point of no return after killing his brother. Due to his pride, he refuses to see himself as anything but a hero until he is no longer able to redirect himself to a path of actual heroism after committing such heinous crimes. I think if Bellos has anything left for his personal arc in season 3, then it will be his anagnorisis. This is when the hero becomes self-aware of the peripatia. He would realize that the human realm has changed beyond his own ideals. Not in a case of redemption, probably not to make him realize the error of his ways, it is a morbid realization for him that no one alive will perceive him as the hero he believes himself to be, that he had devoted his life to nothing, that he killed his brother for nothing. 
Tragic Heroes are a cautionary tale, showing how someone with good intentions can get caught up in themselves and wind up facing a horrendous end or going down a terrible path. It heeds a warning to its audience and is narratively used to invoke a sense of fear. Bellows is such an unsettling villain, not solely because of his power, manipulation, and violence, but because of something so innately human he possesses. Bellows reminds us that we can turn into our own monsters, that we can become the very thing we fear, that we can get so caught up in ourselves that we become blind to reality and end up hurting the people we love most without noticeable remorse. We are all capable of this, and it has happened over and over in our history. If we fail to watch ourselves, we may become the tragic hero of our own stories, our own Hamartia. There's a chance season 3 might dropkick everything I just said into oblivion, but even if the context or like more information is given on the Grimwalkers and Caleb, which I assume there will be, it doesn't change the fact that Bellos is a tragic hero and that his story has a shit ton of tragic irony in it. So this video should be completely destroyed by time, but you know, we'll see. Also, I'm starting university soon, so I have no idea how often I'll be able to make videos when that starts happening, but we'll see when we get there. For now, if you enjoyed, please make sure to subscribe and also comment because I love reading comments and that's pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed the video. Bye!